Hello, and welcome to my session, A Place for Everything and Everything in Its Place, Organizing Your Canvas Course for Positive Student Outcomes. My name is Amanda Beck, and I'm really excited to be here with you. I hope that this um, ends up being a valuable session for you and that you have a chance to take away some ideas of how you can use Canvas more effectively with your students. Um, to begin, I wanted to start with a short overview of what's in my presentation. First, a little bit about myself so that you have an idea of kind of the context that I teach in and, and maybe that might inform you as to how and why I design my courses the way that I do. The second thing would be a Canvas course tour. I actually started using Canvas before TSC adopted it and my experience in using that has informed how I form my courses now and, um, and moving forward. So I wanna be able to show you what that looks like. Um, and finally, tips for building your own courses things that I've found mostly from student feedback that have helped me make my courses more accessible and more user-friendly. So to get started, a little bit about myself. Um, this lovely guy that I'm in the picture with here, that's my husband, Jim. Uh, he actually works in IT. He used to work at Westside in their IT department and left Westside to work in the research park at BSS. Um, so we have a lot of discussions about technology he, of course, from the kind of administrator side, myself from the end user side. Um, and sometimes when I'm griping about things in Canvas, he'll say, well, you know, really the, the infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. And on the flip side, he'll be talking about end users. And I'm like, wait a second. Remember, you know, your end users are, are really the ones who need to be able to access technology. Um, these two ladies over here are my daughters, Lauren and Madeline. Lauren, uh, my older daughter just completed fourth grade or will have completed fourth grade. Uh, at Klondike and is going on to fifth grade and Madeline just finished up first grade and will be starting second grade. Um, I've learned actually a lot about technology from them, not in the sense that, you know, my kids know how to work a phone and apps better than me, uh, but it, especially because they were both virtual in the fall of 2020, um, that I learned a lot about Google Classroom and actually really great ideas for how to use Google Slides. Um, so seeing their coursework and having the opportunity to interact with them and their teachers in a virtual setting actually really informed my own design of my task for my students uh, while I was at school in the building. Speaking of my students, uh, I have been at Harrison. Uh, I will be starting my 15th year in 21-22 uh, school year. I teach German. Um, I love it. It's my passion. It is what I get super pumped up about. Um, and this right here in the middle or kind of toward the left here is uh, Mannheim. That's where we have a partner school. I run an exchange with a school over there. We go there every every other year and then they come here, the same group. And it is such a great experience to watch my students go from not knowing any German to being able to communicate with natives. Um, if anything, my experience in Mannheim has really shown me the difference in technology in schools. Uh, I mean, we've been one-to-one -one for quite a long time. They have almost no technology in their classrooms. And if they do, it's because the teacher brings their own personal devices to school. Um, they don't have, a, uh, they have Moodle, but nobody really uses it. Um, and, and I think it's such a huge difference uh, in terms of the expectation of doing things on paper pencil versus technology. And it's really, really been eye-opening for me. Um, and actually my German colleagues also usually come to the United States and say, wow, you guys have so much, how do you use this? What about that? And they've gained things as well. Um, down here is a picture of my students giving a presentation. I have lots of pictures of my students giving presentations and using technology. I'm very tech heavy in my class, uh, but I wasn't all the, always that way. I started teaching in 2007. Back then, overhead projectors and a green screen attendance system. So things have really changed. Um, I really love to integrate the technology that we have. It is not an ends, it is definitely a uh, means to get to something else. I use it as a tool, but I'm not sparing about using it. Um, I think that it's for kids, they they want to access things still on paper, of course, but the technology side can really um, broaden the things that they can do that they can't do on paper with pencil. Um, I, I love having them even just screencast to my projector. They just, they love being able to show what they're doing and it's really cool to have that opportunity um, to really to branch out more than just here's my presentation on paper. 
Um, so that is definitely something that, that I'm always looking for new ideas of how to implement technology. Um, and finally, the last two pictures I have here are actually totally not related to myself in terms of uh, teaching, teaching and, and school. Uh, these two little, little doggies right here, um, I, I try to get away from screens. I have spent so much time, I mean, we all have spent time on screens, you know, working on curriculum, viewing PD, just scrolling through social media to take a break. And I decided in the last year I needed to do other things. So I sit and read a lot and these guys keep my, my legs warm. They love to snuggle. Um, they're just old senior citizen dachshunds who really, really don't want to be bothered anymore. Um, and I've actually taken up piano again, simply because it's a really great way to do something that engages my brain, but doesn't involve a screen. Um, I do love technology, but as everyone, you, there's just something about finding a way to be, to do something engaging, but off of a screen. So learning management systems, that's where we're gonna head to next. As a college student, and I, I will admit, in my college years, freshman year through about junior year, Blackboard was there, but hardly any of my professors actually utilized it. Um, my senior year, because I had to do a portfolio, of course, and my portfolio was a hybrid. It was partially online, but also on paper. Um, they were transitioning. I went to Valpo and they were transitioning at the time from paper to um, an electronic teaching, student teaching portfolio. Um, but Blackboard was, was still not heavily used. And this was 2006, 2007. I completed my master's degree in 2013 and my entire program was through Blackboard. I did it with Indiana Wesley and it was a great experience. And the courses were designed with, with the students in mind. They were designed to be easy to navigate. We were able to upload and download things well, um, but it did, there was a learning curve, especially for um, you know some of my colleagues who had not spent as much time using a learning management system. Um, as a teacher at the time, I was still very paper heavy, um, but as we went one-to-one -one around 2010-11, we also had access to SMART, um, which now, of course, is primarily used for student data storage, but back in the day, I, I'm loath to say that because it makes it sound like it's so long ago, um, but prior to having Canvas, TSC offered us smart to use in a similar fashion. And I, I attempted to use it. I was probably one of the very few people. I was the only person in my department, the world language department, using it that way. And really on our staff, most people still were kind of like, eh, I don't want to have students uploading things, downloading things. And it, it was it was cumbersome. It wasn't super well situated that students could easily upload things, download things. It just it wasn't quite the learning management system that Blackboard was or that Canvas is. Now, I made the switch to Canvas uh, when I started teaching dual credit, actually. Um, at the time, Ivy Tech was offering dual, dual credit for Spanish and French, and I was like, if I don't offer it for German, I won't have a program. So I sought out a program, and I teach dual credit through the Advanced College Project, um, which is through Indiana University. And part of the reason uh, that I got to use Canvas was because they were switching to Canvas at IU Bloomington and actually on all IU campuses, um, campuses, so much Canvas. Um, and so I got trained in Canvas in the summer of 2014, which was prior to TSC using it. Um, and I, I used what IU came up with um, and it, it had its moments. Um, so I'm gonna turn to my next piece here, which is gonna give you a little bit of a tour of my Canvas courses. So the second part of my presentation is then the tour. Um, what you're seeing on your screen is my very first Canvas course. This was actually imported from a base course that I use the AIs put together for the entire German department. And I think most departments run like this over there. They have kind of this pre-made course that you import all the assignments. Um, and you can then customize it to whatever your students or your particular class needs. Um, I did that. I always had a landing page. The image, of course, you can't see anymore. It must have been deleted. I had it linked via, um, via a website and it, of course, is no longer there. Um, as you can see here on the left, I have a whole bunch of things that they could access, pages, assignments, discussions. I do leave the grades, I have always left the grades um, section open for my fourth year students because I do have to give two separate grades and in the, the grade section in Canvas, they can see what their IU grade is, which isn't always the same as their Harrison grade. Um, the course itself, I always have had a landing page or I used to always have a landing page, um, just kind of with some information. 
the primary thing though I always focused on were the modules because I feel like that is where you can very easily load lots of material. So my first courses, I did it by chapter and then I would kind of just load all this stuff into the chapter, right? No like organization really just knowing that this is all for unit E is what it was called. Um, and then we skipped one and we went to two. So just things, Canvas quizzes, notes, links to external things, um, assessments, it all just kind of got dumped into a unit module. Um, and that was my, my initial courses. Over time, I started kind of saying to myself, well, I don't really know if this is best because it was difficult for students to navigate what things were due and when. And I've always tried to use due dates to help organize their Canvas calendar. But at the time, my students weren't using Canvas in all their other courses. So there was pretty steep learning curve for both themselves and myself. Um, and as time evolved, I started getting a little bit more organized because I just felt like, hey, I'm not really serving my students' needs here. So this was um, by the spring of 2019. This is how my courses were starting to shape up. And of course, TSC was already using Canvas by that point. Um, but my students as dual credit students for the, at that time period, I still had them use the IU, um, the IU Canvas site. And of course, like I said, I had organized them into a little bit more specific modules, a syllabus, um, various units. Quizlet for the vocabulary, I was trying to really make it accessible to them, um, grammar notes, and then every week had a module and I kind of just dumped all these things in here. It was primarily homework assignments, um, you know, first week of participation, these different assignments out of their workbook. And most of my courses at the time were, were set up similarly. Um, in my own courses within TSC, um, this was my fourth year course, uh, the, the following year. So in 2020, actually, um, 2019, 2020, that was my last year that I, uh, sorry, 2018, 2019 was the last year I used Canvas with IU. I decided after that, that I was going to start importing the course into my Harrison Canvas course, because it just was easier for students to have fewer places to access the information. Um, really, they only use their IU Canvas course to sign up for the class. Otherwise, they don't use it at all. Um, I've pulled everything into TSC and I got permission from IU to do that. Um, so really what I started then doing was, again, organizing kind of some things by topic. Every chapter had its grammar notes. Um, every chapter has its vocab list. And then I organized by weeks. And again, I just dumped the homework in and then the participation and the homework participation. Um, 1920, right, that school year, that was the year in the spring where we had to go virtual. So that also kind of threw, um, threw me a little bit for, <laughs> for us all for a loop, but it threw me for a loop into as to how I was going to organize this, that my students could work independently, that they couldn't just open Canvas and go, okay, there's all these things in here. What do I need to do? Um, I have here also my German 1 course from last year. I modeled my other courses. I sometimes teach German 3. Um, mostly I teach German 1 and German 4. So my German 1 course from the 2019-2020 school year kind of modeled after my IU course. Um, and I, I had a landing page, right, with some links, modules, useful class links, Duolingo, just things that I wanted them to have quick access to. And it almost was supposed to be like a class website, right? But really all the content I wanted them to, to access was in the modules. And if you notice here, I really started to learn some things like narrowing down um, these links on the left side, because that when they see, let me go back to this page, when they see all of these, they start to get a little overwhelmed and they don't necessarily know where to click. So again, I had narrowed these down. Um, and just so you can get an idea of what my modules look like at the time for my German one class, this was the spring of 2020. I had been doing what I'd done for all my other for all of my other German four students, which was kind of doing it by chapter or by unit. So I would dump in the vocab list and a Quizlet and I got pretty fancy and started indenting things. Um, and then I would add homework assignments to the bottom of the module. So, you know, this was uh, January 14th. Um, this was classwork. They must have had a sub on the 21st and then the 24th. This was a homework assignment, the 30th. So I was easy to tell students, OK, always look at the bottom of the module. Right. So 2020, of course, threw us all for a loop. We're humming along ca chapter seven, chapter eight, and then everything stops. Um, and that was where I added a module toward the bottom of e-learning expectations. And then I ended up arranging because I could not think of a better way to get this information to students. I started arranging for those last 
one, two, three, four, five weeks of school. Oh, six weeks of school. Man, that was a long time. I started arranging it by week. Um, and I tried really hard to make sure that I dated things so that they knew when they were supposed to, like this was for Wednesday, April 1st. They knew that on that date, here's what I need to click on and here's what I need to do. Um, April 2nd, April 3rd. And I tried to make it so that it was more or less foolproof. Um, but it definitely was a change in dynamic from chapter seven and previous experiences for them where they had just to go into the module, go to the bottom of the module and find what they needed. Um, thankfully, because I had spent so much time putting assignments into Canvas and really utilizing Canvas, and I don't mean just linking things like this is a link to a Google Doc, I mean actually building quizzes within Canvas and using those features um, that are not external tools, but that are Canvas specific, uh, that really, really helped me as I was building these out. Um, so that brings me to this year, this school year. This school year, I decided I spent a lot of time this past summer, summer of 2020, as we all did, looking at professional development. I found a really a couple of really great um, PLCs, professional learning communities. I definitely recommend joining. Uh, there are a couple of really great Canvas Facebook groups. Um, if you're on Facebook, uh, Twitter is a little bit less active, at least in my experience about Canvas, other than people really complaining about it. And quite honestly, the Facebook pages are all full of complaints as well. Um, but I think that if you can cut through the noise, you can find some really, really great things. So even here, you can see that this past fall, I started to really simplify. I only wanted students to access the home page, which is this, and modules. Um, so the home page, there was an image here. Again, that image is no longer there. And I tried to put it back in here for this for the sake of this presentation, and I could not edit the page anymore, which was kind of a bummer. Um, but just so you get an idea of what my course looks like, right? So I got fancy because all these people were talking about using buttons. And I was like, oh, I could use buttons. That'd be great. So I put buttons in here. And of course, then I played with the formatting forever. I had to look up HTML coding because they were all just like slightly different sizes. And that it just bothers me to look at. And of course, on student devices, they display differently because Chromebook screens are different sizes than, than computer screens. Um, you know, I tried to include this that they knew right away where to go to join our Google Meets. I included, I embedded um, a Google form here that I ended up not using because it just was, it became too bulky. Um, and then I, I was adding weekly buttons to modules um tech resources and again playing with the size of the buttons and uh, it was kind of a mess um and at the bottom and i always like to include these just interesting little things i find about german language or culture or I find about it in a broader context um and you know i like to include those at the bottom as well but the idea with with these were always for them to be some sort of like landing page you know you go to my course and you have my school my class website um same thing uh actually for german four I had the same thing and I wanted to make it look real pretty and real cute, right? Look at all those lovely little buttons and they're all color, you know, coordinated and they all match with this graphic up here. And then each week, week, of course, they, you know, could click on the week and it would take them right to the module, things we use in class, Quizlet Live, Kahoot, Gimkit, and all of that stuff. Um, you know, I wanted to make it real cutesy. Um, as far as how I organized my course, that paradigm totally shifted for me this past fall. Um, and just so you get an idea of what it looks like, uh, German 4, I changed, in fact, I changed all of my classes pretty drastically last, um, last fall. Uh, and the very first thing I did, and of course, I kept some of the more generic modules, a text, the textbook, right? It's a nice to have its own module. It's very, you can, it catches your eye right away. Vocab lists, same thing as before, grammar lists. But what I decided to do this, this past fall uh, was really to dive in to doing things week by week. Um, I was finding that that I liked that setup a bit better from actually something I learned out of the terrible spring of 2020 was that I liked setting up my course uh, week by week. I felt like my students knew right where to go, knew, knew what to click on because things were really, really well labeled and really well organized. Um, I broke things down by week. Um, I also discovered a few things like text headers that was like a light bulb for me, like, wow, look, I can really organize things now. Um, you know, classwork, and then I have some some links of what I want them to do. They have a project, and that had its own little section within that week. So it was nice to start seeing some more organization happening. Um, and I 
carried this on through the entire semester. So I will say that um, it was not easy to do that because it meant that I really had to be organized in my plans. I had to be organized in coming up with what I wanted them to do. Um, that was the negative side. The plus side is that I now have something to work on going forward where I can import those things into my new course and hopefully recycle them. Or if not entirely, then I should be able to use a lot of these things again. Um, my other, my, my next step with at the end of the fall semester, especially when seeing um, these week by week modules, I, I finally said, okay, guys, <laughs> students, it's December, everyone was in quarantine, I had a handful of students in pretty much each course, and I straight out asked them, what would make your experience with my modules better? What did you think about it? And what, how could I improve it? And actually, almost all of them said it was so nice to have things broken down week by week and to have things organized by category. That was a huge, huge help. My German 4 students in particular um, liked a lot of things about that because they knew right where to go, especially if they were in quarantine. That was a huge, huge help. Um, my German 1 students, I just opened up this page so that I could show you. Uh, my German 1 students really, really responded positively to having an assignment every day, to know what they were supposed to do every single day. That was, again, a ton of work for me. Um, but I think for them, it was also super helpful to keep up. I, mean, I, did, I started the school year with students in quarantine already. Um, what I also did, and I don't know if I would do this again, was I ran a Google Meet pretty much every day in almost every class period, and I recorded it. Um, so if students were absent, they could go back and watch the recording. This was especially for me, for German 1, something that I felt was going to be very, very important. Um, because I just, they're, they're brand new to the language. They have no idea, even something as simple as the ABCs. That's not intuitive. That's, they can pick it up on their own, but being able to hear it and somehow still kind of experience what their in-class peers would be experiencing for me was very important. That leads, uh, like I said, to, to my discussion with students at the end of the fall semester. And they, their, their overall response was that they liked things organized by week. That was the top thing. Um, a lot of them then followed up with, we want fewer clicks. We have to click too much. And that is true. If you have to do more than about three clicks for anything, you get annoyed. And that is actually one of people's made major gripes about Canvas. It requires so many clicks to do sometimes the simplest of things. The fact that you can't copy and paste an image in still baffles so many of us that you have to upload the image. That takes a long time, especially if you use a lot of images in your work. Um, so that informed my decisions in second semester of how I was going to rework Canvas yet again. And one of the things I did, first of all, in almost all my courses, because I also taught third year this year, I eliminated everything on the left side. My German 1 students have one place they can go, and that is home. Cute, isn't it? The second thing I did was always, always, always brought the module of the week. Right now, it's the end of May. This is the module for, well, actually, this past week, I need to put the new one at the top. But that, to me, was super critical. And that was one of the things they they wanted this week's information right at the top. To have to scroll to the bottom adds one more step of misery for them. Um, and so I, I thought that was a really great thing to do. Um, and it's really, really simple to move those modules around. It takes about three seconds, but it's knowing to do that, using that student feedback to organize it that way. And again, I have mine set out day by day now. Right, Monday, here's what they have. Tuesday, there it is. Wednesday, there it is. For me also as a language teacher, it's nice to be able to reinforce the days of the week and how they write their dates. Um, but even going to when we were virtual at the beginning of this semester, here's Monday's header and here's um, a page that then explains what I need them to do. Tuesday's header and a page that explains exactly what they need to do. Let's see if it will let me access this. Nope, access denied. Um, which I have further in my presentation, I have explanation of a little bit more about how I used pages. Um, German 4, again, same type of thing. German 1, I tend to, shall we say, baby a little bit more, where I had their day by day, this is exactly what I need you to do on this day. German 4 is all seniors. They don't need quite that many, and, and frankly, I have fewer of them. I have eight seniors this year, which is 
uh, is, for, for a German class is a pretty good number. Um, I, it just depends from year to year how many students I have. Um, but with so few students, I can more easily reach out one to one if they do have questions about content we're covering. Um, and again, as it's the end of the year, the week looks different than it did, for example, at the beginning of the year. Um, but here's their, this is just classwork. And I've broken it down into Monday, they had this, Tuesday, we had no live class, they had an alternative assignment, and Thursday, they had this. Here's their homework for the week. So I started using these text headers to break up my weekly modules and make it a little bit more, shall we say, digestible for them. When we headed back to class, which would be right around here, I put basically one Google Cloud assignment. It was actually Google Slides, where I have a set of slides for each day, a little slide deck for them. Um, I have it set up fairly simply that they click on that. It says which slides that they need to do. In fact, here I'll leave student view so you can see. If I click on that, there we go. I wasn't sure if it was going to leave student view or not. Um, oh, of course, there we go. It's being a little, a little slow catching up with me. There's week one, week two, week three. That's where I was. They have a slide deck and I generally marked which slides that they had to do. If not in the actual instructions, then in the slideshow itself. I was trying to make it so that if a student had to quarantine that they could keep up more or less with what we were doing in class. And I made kind of this fluid back and forth between being at home and being at school. Um, so this, for example, uh, has Monday. I, we didn't have class that week because it was MLK day. This was Tuesday. And then they had to complete these two slides on Tuesday, Wednesday, um, and then they had these next slides to complete. So I tried to make it so that they could work themselves through the curriculum and have this fluid back and forth between home and school. And actually, while I'm here, I might as well show you what I was attempting to show you before it said access denied. It's like a live presentation where, you know, things work and sometimes they don't work. Um, but, oh, there's the page actually. And then of course I clicked, let me click the back button for you. Maybe, there we go. Um, this is just the page that was linked in the module. Week one, Monday, this is what their to-do is. Information, join our live class. There's the password. If you don't live, attend live class, I have linked then um, their Google Slides assignment. And it's the same type of thing. I tell them which slides to complete um, so that they can keep up with, with the work. So we could be a little bit more fluid between being there and not being there. And for the most part, it worked really, really well. Um, and I think part of that is because I had my course organized so, so specifically. Um, as I mentioned, it required from me being very, very on top of things, more so than in other years. But to be honest, that was kind of in some ways a comfort to me because I, my, the, the thought hanging in the back of my head all the time was that I was going to have to quarantine. And if I had to quarantine, what would I have them do? So I had ready made sub plans. Anytime that I had to come home for my kids or if I had to, I had an appointment, I had sub plans ready to go. It was pretty fabulous. This was the first year where I really didn't have to like rack my brain of what am I going to have them do that's a high quality activity. Um, because for the most part, these activities are things that I pulled from Google Slides that I had already made of things I was doing live in class anyway. It was just taking it and adapting it to be done remotely. Um, and I'm glad I did it that way. That is one of the things I've decided I will keep out of this, besides keeping my Canvas courses ultra organized, um, was having the kind of this weekly assignment just because where there's always that one kid or two kids who are gone, they're gone for two or three weeks, they're sick or, you know, they have some other emergency um, and then they come back and say, what did I miss? And I feel bad just handing them a packet and saying, well, here you are. I mean, this at least gives them kind of that day by day. So hopefully you've kind of gotten a, a nice tour of my courses now. Um, maybe you've seen some things that you're like, ooh, how do I do that? So that's actually what I'm gonna turn to now is the third piece of my presentation, which will be kind of those practical tips of how you can implement some of these things in your own courses. So now that you've had a tour of my courses, how can you implement some of these things in your own courses? Um, I have really top three, my top three takeaways and tips of all the things I've learned from PLCs, from interacting with other Canvas users. Um, number one, oh, this is a big one, keep it simple. There are so many great ideas, so many things out there that you can implement. I mean, there's, I had a lot of people like that I saw, kept seeing in Facebook, how do I embed my Bitmoji classroom? How do I, do? I, I skipped all that stuff. 
even the buttons. I did all those buttons and those cutesy things in the fall. I think I am done kind of doing that stuff. Students don't, they don't appreciate it as much as we do, number one. <laughs> and number two, it takes so much time to update and it takes so much time to maintain. And I know like, especially the Bitmoji classroom is like kind of the cool in thing to do right now, but my students need to be able, that their focus is really on academics. And it's not that those things aren't important, but I really, I have tried to emphasize this year, keep it simple, which I didn't really do by having a day by day plan week by week. Um, but that was, that took precedence to me over the cutesy stuff. Um, that was my first thing. The second thing is keep it consistent. That is, that was in the spring of 2020, the saving grace for my students was being consistent. I had already trained them in Canvas. So our transition was weirdly smooth for it being a very, an emergency situation. They knew exactly what to do. And I had extremely high engagement through throughout the entire um, time that we were virtual last spring, I think I had 95%. I had about four or five kids who didn't really do anything out of 130, I think I had last year at large classes. Um, and I was super impressed. And I think a lot of that was because they didn't have to really work hard to figure out what to do. Okay. And the third thing, and this is like I said, what I mentioned with the Bitmoji classrooms and all the buttons and the cute stuff. I am a really big proponent, especially with Canvas, of reducing the extras get a good grip on how to organize your course, how to use the Canvas tools within Canvas instead of using a lot of external tools. Um, and I, you'll find that things run a lot smoother. Um, I'm still working on that myself. I do like a lot of external tools and I like a lot of cool stuff. And I really, I've, I relied very heavily on Google Cloud assignments. So even for me, I'm gonna be learning the new Google LTI Cloud assignments. Um, but I think that that the, the simpler you can keep things, the easier it will be for your students and for yourself. So again, practical tips, here we go. Tip number one, uh, first of all, course images. This sounds really stupid, but students, it, it helps them pick your course out of that, that kind of overall course page. Um, I do this for all of my courses. Unfortunately, right now, mine are all the same, which doesn't help me but they see this little German flag emblem and they know what they're looking for. So to do that in your own course, and maybe you're already doing that, you can skip this, right? You click on settings. So you can see down here, I'm in the settings page and you simply click on the three dots, choose an image, pick an image that's saved to your desktop. I do not recommend using a link if it allows you to. I didn't actually look to see if it did that. Um, save the image to your desktop and then upload the image. And that will then show when they go to click on your course so that they know right away where to go and what they're looking for. OK, um, so this is what it looks like then on the dashboard. I mean, like I said, mine are all the same, but I've used different ones in different years. Um, this one, I just I don't want to say I got lazy. I just was so busy that I was like, this will work for all three of them. I mean, no student is enrolled simultaneously in German one, three or four. Um, and quite honestly, if you have. Um, like for me, a student who's in German one, if I see them again in German three and they see the same emblem, that's not a bad thing. That's, that's again, consistency. That's really important. Okay. Um, the next thing I'm going to re really recommend is reducing these links on the left side. Like I said, my German one students literally only have the, the home link. Um, German three and German four, I have a few other links. I think German four has a discussions link because I do occasionally post discussion board posts for them to respond to. Um, and German 3 and German 4 also have access to the grades feature of Canvas for the simple fact that their grade in Canvas is their IU grade. And of course, their grade in PowerSchool is their, their TSC grade. Um, I turned it off for the lower level students because I don't, I don't really care for the link between PowerSchool and Canvas. It just doesn't work for me. I manually enter grades in PowerSchool. I find that that works better for me. So I turn that off because otherwise you'll get parents and students emailing you and saying, wait, the number doesn't match up with what's in PowerSchool. And I'm like, that's because I entered PowerSchool. And, and even then sometimes if I grade an assignment in Canvas, I don't always type in a grade because if it's completion, I don't need to spend the extra, you know, three seconds per assignment typing stuff. Um, it just, you know, doesn't matter a whole lot. Now, how do you do this? It's fairly simple. You Click on settings, go to navigation, and then you drag which items you want them to see. So I dragged literally everything down below, drag items here to hide them from students. And the only thing, if I wanted to bring one of them back up, I would click on it, drag it up to the top and they could see it. You can tell what they can and can't see by the little eyeball here that's crossed out. 
So they can't see any of these things. I can see them. I could click on grades and it works fine for me on the administrator side, but they cannot. Okay. Tip number three for me is decide what you want for a landing spot. Do you want a page? And maybe you do. There are great reasons to have a page instead of going straight to modules. Perhaps you have other things that you want them to access. That's where buttons and those Bitmoji classrooms and kind of, shall we say, the cutesy things like a little images or GIFs. GIFs are so fun to use in Canvas. Um, you know, that's where those things could be. Or do you want your landing spot to be modules? For me, that's what I decided this year. And I love having that when they go into my class, they see the module for the week right there at the top. They don't have to scroll. They don't have to click because of course, when they have a, when they have a landing page, they either need to click on modules or click on modules. And again, it's just one more click. And for kids who are like busy with six or more classes, the more clicks, the more aggravating it gets for them. Okay. How can you decide how to set that? So on your, um, in your Canvas course, there's always this little menu toward the right side, choose home page. That's where you determine that. When you click on choose home page, what you'll get is a box that gives you a few options. Um, I don't particularly care for the activity stream just because it's not how I organize my work. Um, I clicked on course modules. Lots of people, if you want to have them access a page as a landing spot, you just have to go to pages front page and that will then be their landing spot. Um, to set that, because there are a lot of people who don't know how to set that front page, or maybe you do. If you don't, what you need to then do is click on pages, view all pages, and when you decide which one you want to choose as your home page, you click on it, the three dots, of course, to the right, that's kind of like the magic button in Canvas seems to be able to do a lot, and that's where you can set that page as your front page. So that's where you can decide if you want students to land on a front page and you have it set up to be a web page of some kind, you can set that um, in pages by clicking on the three dots on the page you wanna use and deciding you wanna use it as a front page. That is a really, really um, nice way to set up a course. I mean, really, if you, it just depends on what you do, I, I truly. Um, so another tip that I can give, and I use this a lot, I didn't talk about this when I was giving you a tour because I didn't want to get too much into the nuts and bolts. I think I did, but this hopefully will help you kind of see um, that setting up a course like mine doesn't have to be a painful experience. My suggestion to you is to make a base module, and here's what I mean. You make a module, put whatever you want in it, like for me, I labeled it week one. This is just, of course, one to show you. Um, you know, you could use it by date, you could do it by topic, you could label it whatever you wanna label it, right? I added text headers to break up that module for that week, and I'll show you how to do that here in the next few slides. Um, but that way, I just kind of have my base, mod, my base of my module, and then it's a simple matter of clicking on the magic three dots and duplicating that module. And you can duplicate it however many times you want. That is kind of what saved my sanity because I didn't have to type these things in every single time. What I did have to do, um, because I had mine set up by week, I put the date in because if you don't, kids tend to get lost. They're, they don't know what week they're in. We know, perhaps, maybe. I only know because I have my module set up that way. Otherwise, I would have no idea which week of school I'm in. Um, but it helps to put the date in there. And I tried really hard to make sure that everything was clearly dated Monday, May 17th, Tuesday, May 18th. And I think that that helped them know exactly where to go for things. And if I was like, hey, it was whatever you missed was from May 1st, they could go back in the module where May 1st was and find it. Um, and it was a simple matter of duplicating. And then really when you are done duplicating, you can edit the dates. It's a, it's a qu quick click on the three right? The three uh, dots, you can edit it and leave the week there, change the date, whatever. Um, that saved me a lot of time and a lot of energy. And I know next year when I import, because at the end of this school year, my plan is to import my courses into a sandbox course. Um, when I re-import them next year into my TSC courses, I know I'm going to have to update those things. Um, it's not something I particularly love. It's one thing that frustrates me about, about Canvas is that it's not easy to manipulate dates. There is a way to mass change dates now, but it's still yeah, not super great. Um, as far as creating a base module, like I said, I made my module every week. I would just click on this, duplicate it, and then I would change five to six, and I would change these dates to eight and 12, 
I think math, right? And then I would just change these numbers, right? Tuesday, Monday, whatever, February, Tuesday, whatever, February. And that was really, really helpful for me. Um, I also made a base module for my German four students where it was classwork, tests, projects, homework, participation. And then I would add in with the plus button, all of my quizzes, all of my assignments, um, you know, even if it was, I would add in my links. This is just a link to the instructions for their project. Um, you can add in whatever you want and then you just click on this little it looks like i don't know what it looks like six dots eight dots and you drag things and drop them where you want them to be um, that i found very very useful but having that that base module then to copy and just continue to copy further down uh, saved me a lot of time and it made it a little bit easier to organize even though it was quite a task uh, my next tip, and this ties specifically to modules, is using text headers. This was life-changing for me. I found out about it last summer. I was kind of mad that I didn't know about it beforehand. Would have made my life a lot easier, um, but hopefully you learn enough that it makes your life a little easier. Text headers are those little boxes that I use to put the date. Um, really, all you need to do is click on the plus button. And again, if somebody had showed me, I would have known it was there. A text header, you click you click on the assignment drop down and choose text header and then you just type in whatever you want as a text header in fact you can also indent them so if you have a text header and you want to add something else under it but you need it kind of set off you can add more levels lots of people do them all in caps it would be nice in canvas if there were some way to highlight these or otherwise set them apart that can be a little bit frustrating in my opinion, but it also would then hinder accessibility uh, for screen readers. So, you know, that is the downside upside, right? Uh, but the text headers for me were a game changer because it was much easier for me to organize things in my courses. And somehow, I don't know how I didn't know about them before. I'm a little sad that I didn't, but I'm glad that I learned. All right, so the, here are the text headers in the end. You can add however many you want to a module. If you wanna just have a module with one in there, you could do that. OK, you can drag them. You just click on these eight little dots here, drag them to wherever you want them. It's pretty great. And once you've made your base module, you can, of course, duplicate it and it stays the same. Now, I know somebody out there is probably thinking, "Ooh, how did she get those emojis in there? That was also a game changer for me. That is one of the things I want to suggest to you is maybe adding emojis in there. Um, I feel like it's a really nice way, if you notice, of course, to separate these. I was using them to separate Monday, Tuesday by color. That, that helped, again, just an eye catcher just to, to get them to stop and look a little bit closer. So adding emojis is so, so painfully simple. And again, why didn't I know about it before? I, I didn't. I was too caught up on some of the other nuts and bolts and making a cutesy page. And some of the things organization-wise that would have helped me a lot, I probably should have investigated a little bit more. Honestly, the easiest thing, type your text in. And you can do this on any, it could be an assignment. It could be projects. It could be external links. You can add emojis wherever you want to. You type in whatever text you want and you right click. And this is what pops up is this lovely little box and emojis right at the top. It's so painfully simple. But again, it's a way to catch their eye. And if you're consistent with them and you use the same emojis for things, if you want them to write and there's the pencil emoji or you have you know some other emoji that's like, Every time you see this, you need to do whatever it is that they need to do. That is a really great tip off. Another thing that I found with the emojis um, was actually that you can hold down the Windows button and the semicolon and a box pops up. And then you can just kind of scroll through whichever ones you want. And I <laughs> was just playing around with these. Um, you can use whatever you want, right? There's an eye, they can look at it, they have something to listen to. Um, you know, there are most of the emojis that you would find on a cell phone. You can also copy and paste them in, but these ones in the uh, menu are pretty much guaranteed to show up. There are some that I have to say don't quite show display as nicely as others. So you may need to play around with that if you do end up using the emojis. Um, but I found that to be a really, really great solution um, to, to catching their attention. Uh, so to that, I would add when you duplicate your modules, if you have emojis in there, they duplicate in there right along with everything. So if you add them in once and duplicate those modules, you really don't have to add them in again if you don't want to. Um, and sometimes, and I'm sure you've noticed this with Canvas, if you start typing something, it will start to autofill if it's something you type regularly like days. Um, and it will also autofill with, with emojis if you're typing something that's already been typed before. 
Um, so that's all. just a helpful little little tidbit that I wish I had known. And that was for, for me, that's where I learned about that was in the, one of those Canvas PLC um, groups on Facebook. Um, I think I mentioned this a few times when I gave you a tour of my, my courses. Specific tips here would be to move your modules. Um, I drag the, the module of the week to the top. It is right there front and center. They can't miss it. They can't say, well, I didn't know where it was. It was right there. Just got to make sure it's published. I ran into that a few times with a colleague is that, you know, she would forget to publish things. And of course, then students can't see what's not published. To that, I would add um, the easy way to do this. And I, I feel like a lot of people didn't necessarily know about this was to click on the right corner of the module and just drag it around. And of course, when the module is expanded like this, it can be a pain. So at the top, the collapse all button literally collapses all the modules that are currently open into nice little handy dandy guys like this. And you can just drag them wherever you want them. Now, when you start to get into 20 or 30 modules and they're really, really long, one thing that I finally found was this move module button. You click on the three dots of whatever module you wanna move. You'll get a drop down that says move module, right? And next, a box will pop up on the right side. You can put it wherever you want it. You can put it after, before, at the bottom. Um, and then you pick, like I usually put like this week 18, I will put in here after week 17 so that they're chronologically ordered. And really what I'll do then um, this, this coming Sunday before the, the 17th is I will drag or I will move this bottom module to the top so that my students can see it right away and they're prepared for the following week of school. Um, one other thing I wanted to add was using pages. Uh, I mentioned that that's something I did a lot of this year was using pages because on a page you can more specifically talk about or give more more instruction. I, you know, a link here is nice if you're linking it to a Google Doc with instructions, that's fine. But I was again trying to keep more things in Canvas so I wasn't making them leave the Canvas window to do stuff. Um, and this is just when I click on the link for week nine, this is what it is. Um, I have a link to our to the our Google Meets. I linked it right in there. I linked it to an assignment within Canvas and I told them, here's what you need to do if you're absent today, slides three through six of this Google Cloud assignment. They click submit. Um, I actually generally didn't look at these. I told them it wasn't for me, it was for them so that they could keep up with what's going on. And if they had questions, I would be happy to work with them on it. Very few kids um, met up with me, with asked to, to you know talk with me about questions, but most kids did the work or at least look through it because I, this was the first year where I've had kids extended, having extended absences that they didn't come back to. I didn't know what do we do for the last two weeks. I didn't have that at all. And part of it was because there really wasn't an excuse. Every single day, there was something for them to do. And if there wasn't, I always had some sort of alternative. If it was like we did vocab review, I would say, well, here's a link to a gym kit assignment. I mean, whether they do it or not, I mean, that's kind of on them, but it still gave them something to do that was sort of parallel to what we were doing in person. Um, even homework assignments, it was linked in the module for kids who were in person, but for kids who are virtual, this gives them a step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, do this. And that was really helpful. One other button I wish people had told me about that I'm, again, a little, the things I've learned over the years, this previous and next. If I wanted to go to Tuesdays um, or to the next thing in the module, if you click next, it would have taken me to this, likely to this homework assignment. And then at the bottom of that quiz in Canvas is another next button, which would have taken me to the next thing in the module. Um, things that I found saved me time because then it was just for me, fewer clicks. I didn't have to go back to the module, open the next page, copy and paste and do all that stuff and link it all in. I could just click next at the bottom and go to the next page and view it and adjust it and do whatever I needed to do. Um, but for your information, if you don't know how to link things in a page, I love doing this. I find that it, it takes a lot of information and condenses it down into uh, one location for everything. External links, if you want to link a Google Doc, this, this right here was a link to our Google Meet, was an external link. You highlight the text, click external link, an even better shortcut is Control K. It opens a box where you paste in the link you want. But you can, of course, click external link, paste in the link to meet.google.com. When they click on it, it takes them to Google Meet. Uh, this was an assignment in Canvas. So you can actually link two things within your course. So I linked this text right here to that specific assignment by highlighting it and clicking on course links. Um, what happens then is a box pops up on the right of your screen and you pick whatever you want to link it to. 
So you can link to files, you can link to whatever you want. You could link your page, this, I could have linked this to this page to another page if I really wanted to. Um, it's, the, the, it's endless what, how you could manipulate it to get them to do different things. Um, one other little tip that I didn't know about at the bottom, if you make a page at the bottom, there are these options and you can add this page to a student's to do list. I find this one. I found this one out by accident. <laughs> I was um, going to be absent and I was like, ah, how can I get this on their calendar? Because if, it, if, if, it, if stuff's not on their to do list, if it doesn't show up in their calendar, then they may or may not know it's there. Um, but it was kind of nice being absent and having the ability to literally click a tiny box, add to soon to do. I picked the date that they needed to do it. So it populates on their calendar, populates in their to-do list, and then they click on the link and go right to the page. So again, just little things like this that have made, have made things more organized for students have been really, really helpful. So I hope that, again, you're finding something you can use. Uh, another tip I wanted to add was using dates. I didn't used to do this, um, but I decided in the last few years that I really wanted to be better about making things available and when they're due. Um, I try for a homework assignment, for example, I make it available obviously the day that I assign it and then it's due the next day, right? And I could get specific about times, but to be honest, I have enough other numbers to type in that I don't, I don't worry too much about the times, but you can adjust it however you want. What's nice about this is when you put a due date in, it puts it on their calendar, it puts it on their to-do list. I try to avoid the close, because if you make it available until it will close the assignment, I don't generally use that because there's always that one or two kids who are absent. Oh, I can't get the assignment, you locked me out of it. And so when they always accuse me of locking them out of things, which I don't do, I'm like, um, I don't do that. It's not locked, you gotta click on the assignment and click start assignment. Um, but you can of course do that as well. And it again, they'll see the due date, Maybe you leave it open for however long you want, um, but that due date then populates in their calendar. And if you're looking to help your students stay organized, that's one really helpful way to do that. Um, this is a view of my calendar, what it looks like with the due dates. And of course, mind you, I am one of maybe six or seven classes for these kids. So if I have my things all populated in here and all the other teachers do as well, it can be very overwhelming. I found that students don't necessarily know how to use the calendar. And of course, on the right side, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, you can toggle between your different courses. I do this all the time for mine because I have a lot of assignments for my third and fourth years. They're short, but there are lots of them. Um, and they all populate on Sundays and Mondays. So it can make my calendar look all, I don't know, wonky and just kind of weird. Um, so I tend to toggle between the classes. But like for me, I put a weekly overview on Monday of this is what we're doing this week. Here's what assignments we have. And then because I put due dates in, it populates everything nicely in there. And of course, when we get past the due date, when stuff is submitted, it crosses off. So it's nice for them to be able to see, oh, I have this thing due. I better take care of it. Um, and and Again, for students who need organizational skills that at, at Harrison, we were required to use the calendar and that was one way I was trying to use it effectively to help my students. So that brings me really to the end. Um, I wanted to encourage you that if you have questions to please, please, please reach out to myself, obviously Sarah and the whole tech team, they're really, really awesome at getting back to you and answering questions. Even myself, I had um, a little tech freak out where I imported some things into my course and thought I <laughs> wrecked everything. And Sarah was really awesome for helping me. So even as somebody who's a really advanced Canvas user still sometimes makes mistakes as well. Um, but please, please reach out. You can reach out to me as well. I'm happy to, to coach you. We can even meet up with a Google Meet if you wanted to. Um, my email address is albeck at TSC, as you can see. I'm also on Twitter. That's my um, Twitter username. Feel free to follow me, I'll follow you back and we can swap ideas. And for me, Twitter is a gold mine of not only world language stuff because I'm, I'm a German teacher, it's what I love, uh, but also ed tech. There's lots of really, really great resources for ed tech out there um, on Twitter. And finally, I wanna say danke, thank you, thank you, danke sehr for your attention, for taking time to listen to my presentation. I really hope that you gained something out of this presentation that will help you feel a little bit more organized um, moving forward and help your students to, to be more successful in your classroom. So thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Tschüss.